Hello, James Woodburn here, publisher at Fat Tail Investment Research. Today, I'm joined by none other than the best-selling author and colleague, Jim Rickards. He's the editor of, at the Daily Reckoning Australia and the awesome Strategic Intelligence Australia newsletter. Today, we discuss everything from the Federal Reserve, uh, the risks is systemic in our system, the bubbles that are going on everywhere and what could potentially pop those things. And we touch on China as well. Check it out. So back to China. <laughs> no, that, that was really interesting. Yeah, I sh- yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's a good one. The, the, the other thing that we're kind of internally with, with a few other of our editors we're talking about is the reporting season of the big tech firms too. I mean, they right. had a boom from, Janu- uh, from, from March 2020, work from home, um, you know, and they were the, 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 the few companies that did really, really well in that time. Right. Um, sales of everything went up, like iPhones, uh, iPads, Probably people just bored at home. The, the, the reporting season, I think it's going to be early next year. That will be int- an interesting time too, where the balance sheets might not be as, 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 as strong on the big tech firms. And they make up a large portion of the US market now. I mean, they're the big. Uh, yeah, no, an enormous, enormous portion. Um, and that's right. Uh, maybe uh, I went out and bought a new laptop or a uh, smartphone during the early stages of the lockdown, the pandemic, but I probably won't buy another one tomorrow if I just bought one six months ago. So we'll, we'll see what happens. I'm not forecasting that, but I think it's well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, okay. So let's talk about our friends in China. Um, uh, and Australia and China are joined at the hip. Or they're, I know they're, they have a spat going on, a trade spat. And uh, I, again, I applaud Australia's uh, bravery and forthrightness and calling for uh, getting to the bottom of the, the, where the virus came from. My own view is, I think there's plenty of evidence that came from the Wuhan lab, but uh, Australia hasn't concluded that. They've said, we ought to have a thorough independent investigation. I think that's right. And so they've been sort of smacked down to, uh, by China and Australia has, has stood up very well. Um, and look, there's no denying the strength in the Australian economy. You got a property boom, your stock market is up. Um, the uh, to the point that the uh, Reserve Bank of Australia is, is, will see fit to taper as, uh, soon, you know, fairly soon. I think they've extended uh, the start date for the taper, but they're still they still say they're committed to that. Unemployment's going down, um, so there are a lot of good metrics coming out of Australia. Um, and for that matter, uh, even though China has declared a kind of trade war on Australia. Australian wine. We're getting very good prices on Australian wine here in the U.S. and it's great wine. <laughs> you got to sell. You got to sell it to somebody. Uh, but um, but China just set a record for coal imports from Australia. Australia sold more coal to China than ever before, and because China needs it, and Australia is a great great source. So so it hasn't really hammered the Australian economy, but. There's good reason to believe that the Chinese economy is in serious trouble. And if you're an Australian and you're looking ahead, um, you would take that as a, as a warning sign. Uh, and just to, to put a finer point on that, uh, what's going on inside China? And it's China's always opaque. I mean, Chinese culture is different from Western culture. And so you need to know a lot of Chinese history and, um, you know, religion and philosophy and uh the mandate of heaven. There's, there's a lot to know about China just to even begin to understand it. Um, and then communists are opaque because they're communists. So you put a communist party on a on a Chinese society, it's a little bit hard to 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 understand. Um, but some people have some insights in Europe. I believe Kevin Rudd is a former prime minister. Am I correct about that? He seems to be the leading advocate for you know better relations with China. I'll put it that way. Uh, but he he made a very, some very interesting comments in an interview yesterday, your time, um, uh, and looking at what Xi Jinping is doing right now. And and some of this stuff gets big headlines. I'll come back to Evergrande in a second, but yeah. some of it gets big headlines. You know, they they just hammered DD. DD was the the Uber of China. You know, the the ride hailing company. They did a very successful IPO on the New York Stock Exchange, but they didn't get certain permissions and the Chinese security agencies. Uh, not not securities in the sense of stocks and bonds, but uh, internal security, you know, the spies, in other words. They had serious concerns, national security concerns about the information you could get on the uh, DD app about locations and whereabouts, et cetera. Uh, that was never resolved before the IPO. They went straight for it. So they've been slapped down. Um, they've been, uh, their, their uh, applications have been amended. They've been threatened with the possibility that they may be forced to delist from the New York Stock Exchange and maybe relist 
or not in the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, but not just Didi, uh, Alibaba. Where's Jack Ma? I call him Jack in the Box. I mean, I, I feel sorry for him. He's obviously under some kind of house arrest. He's, he's hidden. Uh, so we haven't seen or heard much of Jack Ma or almost nothing. Um, Alibaba was slapped down when they wanted to do a, uh, an IPO of their financial company, Blue's Ant. Uh, was was the was the name of the company. Uh, Pony Ma is a guy who runs Tencent. Uh, they're under scrutiny, but this is across the board. Mm. So, and this is completely alien to Western investors. Like, wait a second, yeah, you know, regulation. Yeah, there's a place for regulation. You can't you can't break the law. You can't be out of control. Maybe some antitrust. That's all normal. But you don't go out as a party with an ideology and systematically destroy wealth. That's that is alien to the Western way of thinking about it. But yet, here you have to put on your Marxist, you know, virtual reality glasses, you have to think of it as a 21st century neo-Marxist and say, what do they care about? When you destroy wealth in Chinese stocks, whose wealth is it? Well, it's either the oligarchs or Western investors, you know, because BlackRock is busy stuffing all these Chinese companies into mutual funds and index funds and selling them to retail investors by the hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, or people were buying Walt Disney, which is, you know, a whole you know, subsidiary of the Communist Party of China. So the point is, um, the wealth belongs to uh, either Chinese oligarchs or Western investors. Now, do, do, does the Communist Party of China care about oligarchs? No, they want to squash them. They're, they're worried about them. If you, if you, you know, Jack Ma's problem was it was more popular than Xi Jinping, and they become rival power centers. So they don't care if they destroy that wealth. Do you think they care about Western investors? No, they would love to destroy the wealth because who's getting hurt? Your, your political rivals. What's being strengthened? The Communist Party of China. Yeah. So whereas there's an alignment of interest between government and Wall Street in the United States or, you know, the same thing in Australia, there's a complete, uh, there's a completely adversarial relationship between the Communist Party of China and both Wall Street and the oligarchs. So are they destroying wealth? Yeah. And they, they don't care because they're hurting their enemies as far as they're concerned and they're strengthening the party. So a plenty of indication that China is slowing down. Uh, and now, now let's turn to Evergrande. Uh, Evergrande is the largest. Yeah, that, that could be the, the, the canary in the, in the coal mine. Like, I, th- I think it <laughs> is. I think it may be, but in, but in a, maybe a different way than people expect. And, and I'll explain. So Evergrande is the largest property lending, uh, property development company in China. And it's got its tentacles everywhere, all kinds of subsidiaries and affiliates and uh, other interests, et cetera. It's a huge company. It would be, it would be as if you combined, uh, you know, in our, you know, Fannie Mae or the, you know, the, the, the government mortgage agencies in the United States, you know, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac combined with, uh, you know, maybe Amazon. That would, that would be what, what Evergrande is, a huge company. Um, it's, uh, my view, insolvent. It's heading for bankruptcy. Um, People kind of know that. You're like, yeah, big deal, Jim. Everyone can see that one coming. Uh, the bonds recently were trading at 40 cents. And like, what are they thinking? And of course, they went down to now around 20 cents or 10 cents. Maybe there's a little salvage value there once you wipe out equity. That much is known. Okay. And it's kind of priced in, not completely, but priced in. And the Chinese government has the resources to take over this company and they'll decide who wins and loses. Do you want to whack the stockholders? Do you want to bail out the bondholders? Those will all be political slash economic decisions. And the government has the resources to do that. And a lot of people are underplaying what's really going on there. But here's here's where most people don't see the problem and where the communists definitely do not see the problem. It's the ripple effects. This company has its tentacles everywhere. It has who knows how many thousands of counterparties, suppliers, lenders, investors. How many uh, wealth management products have been sold to retail investors in uh, China where the banks took the money and would turn around and bought Evergrande uh, because it had a higher higher yield? How many retail investors are in Evergrande? How many um, wealth management products will will suffer a run on the bank? How many banks will suffer a run on the bank once these losses start to show up? Uh, And, you know, the, the retail are always the last to know. That's just how it works. So, so my, my expectation is that Evergrande will go into some kind of bankruptcy sooner than later, and they'll think that it's all being administered uh, smoothly, and they have the reason only to discover that the ripple effects just been completely out of control. And that's what, again, I had experience with this. That's what happened in long-term capital management. Why on earth, in 1998, why on earth should the Federal Reserve and the 14 biggest banks on Wall Street care 
if some hedge fund in Greenwich, Connecticut went out of business? Yeah, right. Well, the answer is they weren't bailing us out. They were bailing themselves out because we had $1.3 trillion of derivatives and the counterparties were all the banks on Wall Street. And I said, not glibly, but just as a matter of fact, I said, you know, we, you know, we, had, we had a bankruptcy team, we had a tax team, we had a Cayman team, we had a New York team, I and mean, there was so much going on. And I was kind of in the middle of it, but I said, you know, honestly, if we file for bankruptcy, I'll just sleep in the next day. You guys are gonna own, you guys are gonna own $1.3 trillion of positions that you didn't know you had. Uh, yeah. because, because the Wall Street are intermediaries, they're short and, and long the same thing. So they, they, they think they're flat and risk managed, but when one side goes away, they're just long. Uh, and the whole market's crashing. And that's why they bailed us out. It wasn't to do us a favor. It was to save themselves. And same thing with Evergrande. Um, the Chinese don't have the experience uh, with this that New York lawyers and, uh, for that matter, Pierpont Morgan did. And uh, they're not going to know how to manage it. And it uh, could easily spin out of control. I was going to, I was, sorry, Jim, you're going to add something to that. Well, I'll just add quickly um, one last thing. And then I'll kind of have to uh, yeah, yeah. maybe sort of wrap up. There's something very weird going on in China right now. And I'm using weird in the technical sense. Um, there are two figures. Uh, I, have a, I have an article uh, right here, uh, but I, I wrote an article about this for one of our US publications, but maybe you can call my, call my US editor and borrow it because I'm sure yeah, the yeah, sure. readers would love to see it. But there are two figures. One is called Li Guangmang, and the other one is called Hu Shijin. So Li and Hu um, for names. No one's ever heard of them. Okay, so Li is kind of a blogger, gadfly, but a very hard left communist. Uh, he'd bring back the Red Guards if he could. Uh, Hu is, of course, also a communist, but he's a party regular. So Li published an article not long ago, and he sort of sounded the trumpet. He said, you know, we've got to crush these tech companies, crush the entertainment business, they're get rid of video games. They're polluting the youth. They're, they're, they're slime. Just crush it all in the name of part of communism, party loyalty and the purity of the party. It was an extreme uh, prescription of a kind that we haven't really heard much since the cultural revolution. Uh, who comes out a couple of days later with a rebuttal? And he says, look, um, you know, you're right. We need regulation. Uh, we need energy. We need all that. But you've gone too far. We, we can't throw the baby out with the bath. We need to preserve this, what they call capitalism with uh, Chinese characteristics. They got some kind of catchphrase for it. We need to preserve the good of entrepreneurship and capitalism, but without the bath. So let's rein them in, let's regulate, but let's not destroy the whole thing. Um, now, first of all, what's interesting is that both of those views were published and allowed to be disseminated. If China doesn't like something, they just limit it. I've been to China. I can't use Twitter because it's not, it's not allowed. I mean, you can't use all the social media that we're used to. So the fact that both views were published and disseminated tells you that there's a debate going on, going on inside the Communist Party leadership. Because if they were unified on the subject, only one of those views would have been out there. or that made, Who would not have been necessary because Lee would have been squashed. Uh, but Lee's out there and who's out there? And they're like, okay. Whose side do you want? But that, things like that don't happen by accident in China. Somebody green-lighted that. Now, which means that there's an eternal debate inside the, inside the Politburo, inside the Communist Party leadership, which is, what are we going to do? Are we going to come down hard on these tech companies and oligarchs and entertainment and uh, uh, gaming and uh, online gambling and, um, you know, and, and a lot else? Uh, or are we going to just work around the edges and try to keep it in a box? Um, and that's a real debate. And it reminds me, uh, here you have to go back to 1956, uh, but Mao Zedong uh, published a, a, not much more than an epigram. But what he said was, uh, let a hundred flowers bloom, let a hundred schools of thought contend. That was the English translation. Let a hundred flowers bloom, let a hundred schools of thought contend. And Chinese intellectuals and artists and writers and others said, took that as a green light. Say, so, hey, they're going to tolerate some dissent. They're going to tolerate different views. You know, that we can mix it up a little bit. And, and so they did. So the hundred flowers bloomed in the form of tens of thousands of intellectuals and artists and professors and others who started to write critical views of, uh, of uh, communism. 
Um, and uh, the following year, they were all rounded up and killed. Uh, in other words, it was uh, it was the ultimate uh, bait and switch. You know, as Mal only did that to, to to bring them out of the bring them out of the woodwork and expose themselves, and then they were rounded up. Some were sent to thought re-education camps, the lucky ones, and a lot of others were executed. So, my question as between who and Lee, who's the flower? Mm-hmm. In, in other words, if you once you set this debate, you're kind of inviting other people to jump in on both sides. But one side might get wiped out, uh, probably will. Uh, but it's hard to know which, because again, the debate is inside the party itself. But, but, but Kevin Rudd, I referred to him earlier, who um, um, we may not share many political views, but I'll give him credit for having pretty good insights into China. He said something along the lines that I just said, which is that um, uh, there's there's a real debate going on. But he came down on the side that, they, that, that it was going to be party first, capitalism second that they were in fact going to crush a lot of these values so if i were an investor i would just get out of china stocks while there's still time wow jim that, that's great um I, i'm that, that answers quite a number of my questions i was going to ask anyway so that that's awesome it would just be it's just going to be a fascinating thing to watch scary as well in a way i mean yeah um, you just don't know if if the china if china can actually reverse the laws of economics do you know what i mean if if uh, if something if if evergrand is that layman brothers moment do right. they have the capabilities to actually step in and, and the experience but l- let's carry on that discussion another day i know you've got to sure. you got to run so thanks so much for your time jim and yeah all this and more is in your latest issue of strategic intelligence australia and um yeah until next time mate thank you very much thanks Wendy.